There we go. All right. So I'm going to demonstrate how to use those introductory painting skills from controlpaint.com. I've got all of the handouts here from the two brush control exercises. And the third one, which was basic brush control, had no exercise associated with it. So don't be worried if you couldn't find that. I previously completed these on my own for a number of different classes. So I just kind of have these complete sheets here. But we can get all the empty ones uh, from the Google Drive or from the site directly. So I'm just going to pop that up really quick. So here I am in our Google Drive, Resources, and then I'm just going to download these real fast because I don't have blank ones. So let me grab all three of them. Number one, two, and three. So as a reminder, I'm just going to be demonstrating the basic usage of these techniques that are taught in the video. So be sure to actually watch the video and visit the site directly for all of that. Um, and I'm also going to try to demonstrate it not only in Photoshop, but in Krita as well. So that we've got a good idea that all of this stuff can be done in either program really, really easily. So I'm going to throw these worksheets all into the same file just for ease of demonstration. Oops, got to hit enter first before it allow me to do that. There we go. Throw this third one in here. There we go. But you can have them as separate files if you want to. Uh, either way is fine with me. Oh, let's start on the black and white one, actually. I'm going to unlock this background just by double clicking, hitting OK, and then shuffle it so that I've got the black and white one down at the bottom first. OK. So in the very first video that doesn't have any uh, associated worksheets, he talks about the basics of the brush panel and brush control. Just know that you generally need a hard brush, a soft brush, and a somewhere in between brush. Those would be the three basic kinds. But you can make all three of those from one standard beginner. So if I just get this round uh, brush head and start turning off these features, what I end up with is this uniform width brush that doesn't pay any attention to pen pressure. And that's not going to work very well. I can't really do very much interesting stuff with it. Let me erase away that. Uh, but it can fill a certain need every now and then. You might just need to make some very, very strict shaped lines or something like that. I tend to not even really have one of these in my toolkit. Uh, but if you did have one of these, I would say at least make it pretty small so that if you had to make some technical guidelines, then they wouldn't be large, cumbersome shapes. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just make really quickly those brushes just to show you that it can be done. Um, the first basic kind of brush that you need is just shape dynamics. So if we turn that on, you can see the preview is smaller on the ends and bigger in the middle. And if I click the word, and of course the interface changes a little bit from program to program. Um, we can see that I've got a minimum diameter. I'm just going to set that to zero to show the full effect. But I tend to set it a little bit higher because I don't like it to come to a perfect razor sharp point. So now what I have when I press down is a very, very thin line until I press harder and harder and harder. And then it gets full thickness. Okay, So that's one of the very first simple kind of brushes. This is useful for inking. It's useful for drawing. Um, sometimes you could use it for uh, filling in large areas if you increase the size, but that would be one of the most basic types is just this. I'm going to turn that feature off and then turn on transfer. So transfer is how opaque your brush is. And so when if I'm pressing lightly, you're going to get very little pigment. When I'm pressing heavily, you'll get a lot of pigment. And again, I'm going to turn down the minimum so that it fades all of the way. So now I'll go ahead and just make my brush bigger so it's easy to see. When I press lightly, you'll see a very hazy color. And when I press heavily, you'll see a much more opaque color. And if I press very heavily, you can even start to see the brush spacing, which is this effect right here. So probably you guys can see that on the video, I think. But all of these little overlapping circles, that's the brush spacing. Um, your brush is not infinitely spaced very, very thinly. It's putting down these brush heads one at a time as if it were dots. And if I turn up the brush spacing a lot, let's see, spacing, there we go. If we turn up the brush spacing a lot, you can see them separate out to the point where you actually do get a dotted line. 
Uh, the lower this spacing is, generally the higher quality blend you're going to get with your tool, but also it's going to demand more on your GPU or your CPU, depending on how you're running your program. So you want to hit some sweet spot where you generally don't see these overlapping circles, but also the number is as high as possible. Although with blending modes, and as long as you're not really moving your hand as fast as possible across the screen, you're not going to run into a problem. I tend to leave it around 15 to 10 percent, but it's not uncommon for people to have that much lower, especially if they have higher quality effects that they would like to see. So those are two basic brushes. We've got a transfer only brush and we've got a um, size only brush. If we combine those two together, then we have to start working with those limits. So here's shape dynamics and transfer dynamics. So zero minimum, zero minimum, no jitter, by the way. Jitter is just if you want it to randomly kind of bump up and down, which gives a more randomized effect. So now if I press lightly, I get light and thin lines. If I press heavier, I get darker and larger lines. And if I press very heavy, I get full-sized thick lines. I don't know typically a use for this brush. Um, I can't think of a good reason why I would have both of those activated and no minimum because I already can't see those lines at all when they get even just 50% thickness and down at the very lowest, you can't see anything over here. So typically you're going to want some sort of mixture of those things, but not 100% uh, from zero to 100% mixture like that. It's just gonna make it not really very useful for anything. But let me try to tune this really quick to show a application where you have them both activated, but they're not you know, so severe. Uh, for one thing, I like to turn the minimum diameter up at least a bit. So 15, 20%. That means at my lightest pressing, this thing is not a sharp little ice pick or pinpoint or something. And if I turn on transfer, this one I like to be quite generous with the minimum, like 50% or something. Um, and then sometimes I'll turn down the flow itself or the opacity if I want to paint lighter. So now if I press lightly, I've got a small but visible sized uh, pen stroke that has pigment being put down pretty visibly but way way darker than it was before a little bit darker and we get some medium strokes and darker than that we get our full opacity strokes again okay so this would be some sort of like rough sketching brush that i might want where i can just put in some shapes and some parts of it could still look a little bit hazy like if i wanted some sort of like fluffy candy wrapper on the side of this or wings or something but i can still press hard to get full opacity so that's a, a sort of in-between tool, okay? Uh, all of this is without any change to the brush tip head. The brush tip head that I'm using right now is just a perfect circle and it's sharp too. So all the edges are distinct. It's not blurry at all. Uh, but even up here with Photoshop's basic circle brush, you've got a hardness slider that you can turn down. And if you do, it becomes a hazy gradient. That's full pressure I'm pressing right there. And if I turn it up 50%, then it's a slightly soft circle, but not nearly as distinct as the original one. So that slider is here along with a basic sizing slider, but it's also here in the actual brush menu. You just have to go up to brush tip shape. So if I'm going to use this partial transfer, partial shapes dynamic kind of setting, I usually will also turn the hardness down on that circle at least a bit. Usually 50% is fine for me. And now I've got something that I could actually blend with if I wanted to. So if I chose a different color, like this, it's not going to be impossible for me to blend those colors. I'll go ahead and sample, move the color along, sample, move the color along. Because I don't have a harsh solid outline on my brush, it's not so bad to kind of blend back and forth like that. We could even just do it directly. So grab that blue and I could just drag straight down. Let's get a little bit of the transition color. Oh, I do have to press harder with this. So it's a little annoying. If I'm pressing lightly, I get no pigment transfer, but also the shape is really small. And so that's a reason why I wouldn't normally use this combination like that. Okay. So those are some basic brushes. 
in the exercise, I believe he uses nothing more than those brushes. Let me take a look here. So something to shape and something to blend. In fact, you could get away with just two brushes now that I'm looking at the sheet. And so up here in these tool settings, I've got a bunch of these pre-saved for myself that I just frequently use. So I have a airbrush. A focused airbrush for me just means that the sizing is active. And a standard airbrush just means that it's always the full size, no matter how hard I'm pressing. So that's the difference for me. So I use those two. Uh, inking brushes, and I have a number of them, just based on how um, scratchy or blotchy they are, are just full opacity brushes that only obey sizing. There we go. And these other variants are just different ways to make that line shakier or rougher. Let me make this a bit bigger so it's easier to see. So even while I'm making this stroke, probably pretty hard to see, there's a bit of roughness in the edge there created by the brush itself. A distressed one has a huge amount of that roughness. And a blotchy one, I forget what the idea was here, but there was something, oh, that it has a really big spread between little and big. And when it's big, the shape is rough. And when it's small, the shape is smooth. So those are the inking brushes. And I hardly use the variants, really. I'll usually just use the standard one. Um, I've got a few Kyle's Drawing Box uh, special brushes from someone else. They just kind of are specialty things. I won't go into them too much, but you can find a lot of downloadable or purchasable brushes for Photoshop. Um, they're all over the place. I wouldn't go too crazy with them right away, but they can be a big help if you want to get certain looks. Mr. Natural Brush is really nice. The only thing I don't like is that the default icon is this huge shape, which is kind of misleading because you can go down to a very scratchy small size. Pastel is a really good one too. Got a lot of nice texture to it. Uh, marker brushes. These are the 50-50 between size and transfer, and I use these quite a lot. So my standard marker is kind of just how I described. It can get bigger and smaller a little bit, but it's mostly for pigment. Then blending is a lot softer, and streaky is a lot harder, and it has a different brush tip shape so that, let's get find a blank area, so that you can see these little trailing streaks inside the brush itself for a more traditional look. Painting brushes, so these are the softest ones of all for me. They're only primarily used for blending pigment, not for size at all. I've got a frizzy one, and that's it for those. I guess I have other ones in different packs, but this is the one I have loaded. Uh, pencil, for me, I just make my own pencil, which is uh, a small sharp line, but also has a little bit of texture to it because I find that the um, basic brush is far too harsh and digital looking and a pencil standard I forget what the difference is between these two I think this one's just more opaque then over here I have some specialty ones like a frizzy texture Let's zoom out for that one this would be filling in an entire area now if we wanted to streaky paint I don't even remember let's see okay that's what it is for some reason it's very very harsh on the sides and streaky I don't remember why I even made that and then a pixel brush, which is an anti-alias tool. We'll go over um, the difference between alias and anti-alias later on, but we will be doing some pixel art at some point. Um, just know that for now, Photoshop's not the best tool for pixel art. I have better ones that are free and browser-based that we can use, but you can do it and you need to use a different tool primarily for that, okay? So pretty much all I'm gonna use in this demonstration then is a standard inking brush, which is capable of just putting down a shape in a nice solid way. I might actually use the marker because it's a little less um, a little less harsh because there is a little bit of transparency. You can get some forgiveness in there. That's kind of why I like it. And then the other one I'll use is an airbrush. So those will be the only two kinds of brush I use. Over in Krita, I don't even remember what I have available, but I can easily pick out brushes that are appropriate or just make them on the fly if we need to. Any questions about basic brush usage and what you should be looking for in your brushes? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So can you show me how to save uh, or 
how to save a preset. Yeah. Sure. So to, to set it up and uh, save it for like onto a USB because it, sure. it wasn't showing up in my home folder. Uh, I kept trying and trying and trying. So first you set up your brush, however you pick the brush tip head and decide on features or whatever. And I'm not even sure what this one is, but I just picked it out of the little drop down list there. So it appears to have some texture to it. Fine. The way I save this brush as a tool, which is what I prefer, you can save brushes in here, but I prefer to save them as a tool, is to just come into this menu and hit the new button when you have your tool all set. Give it a name. So we'll say this is our test brush. You can include the color. I almost never do that because I want whatever color I've got selected to stay the active one. The only time I would is if I'm making a set of brushes specifically for something special, like they must be used with a white color or they must be used with a black color. Otherwise, I just leave that and I say, OK. And then it adds it to this list. To save it as a file, like you were asking, now we have to export this. So I would go up to this arrow. Uh-oh. Oh, there it goes. I don't know why it's, for a moment it was grayed out, but then I clicked into this window and tried again and it worked. So I'm going to go up to this arrow and we can do save tool presets. You can also load them. We could also reset them if I'd somehow changed these for some reason. So if I go save tool presets, then I'll go to the desktop and I can give it any name I want. So we'll call these Tabor brushes dot TPL. And now when we want to load that, we would just come up into here and say load browse for that file and then it will put it right in here. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. I'm going to also put that into you guys resources folder so that you have the brushes I'm using in case you want to use exactly the same ones. I don't know how many versions of Photoshop that it will work with, but so far every time I've tested it, it's worked with every new version of Photoshop. So give it a try if you want. And if you don't want to, or want to make your own, feel free and go ahead and do that. How do we change brush settings on Krita? I'll get to that when I'm in Krita. Okay. Any other questions about this, especially in Photoshop since we're still in here? All right. Let's go ahead and do some demonstrations then. So the two different methods primarily that he discusses is either making a shape, locking the shape so that you can't go outside of it, and doing something uh, right on top of it, or filling in some uh, content in the middle, like the gradient first, and then trimming away the excess until you get the proper shape. And in both cases, he recommends using something he calls temporary layers, which some programs are even set up to use natively with like a single button click to combine or merge the contents. So I've got an empty layer here, and I'll just say, call this main. And then I'm going to create one more. This would be my temporary layer. But there's not going to be much point of naming this because I'm going to merge it down over and over and over again. So it's just going to get destroyed over and over. So I'm going to select the white color from this shape over here. Let's see what brush I've got. I want a standard marker brush. And of course, I'm going to zoom in so that I'm nice and big on the screen and I can see what I'm doing. And the first thing I'm going to try to do is just make that shape. So I want to try to mimic this as close as I can. And since we've got the availability of erasers, sometimes you can draw something right away. Sometimes you need to just get it close enough like this and then erase away out of it. I do have several different erasers also, but really the difference is, are they soft or are they hard? This eraser that I'm currently using is too soft. So you can see how as I'm doing that, it's taking away far too much too gradually. So I'm going to come up to my tools and choose a I'm going to choose a hard transparent eraser because that means if I press lightly I take a little bit away if I press heavily I take all of it away and that's usually flexible enough to do just about everything so now with this drawn shape I'm just going to chisel away at it until I get approximately what I see on the right hand side so something like this and don't worry about being super, super picky about this, but do try to get it somewhat accurate like that. Okay, close enough. Maybe one more. Okay, 
I'm being a little bit too picky, but close enough. So now that I've got that, I've got a couple options for how to proceed. Um, this is on a layer all by itself, which is one of the benefits of the way that he works. So I can still move it. If I drew it slightly too far off to the right or left, I could move it. If I drew it slightly crooked, I could rotate it. Okay, Or I could even scale it. I've got to commit that before I can undo in Photoshop. And that's all just using the movement tool or control T uh, is what I chose there. And so I've got the benefit if I say like, oh, you know what, it's a little bit too tall. I can just squeeze it down or rotate it a little bit or something like that. Hit enter and we're good to go. But now I want to add this gradient that we can see across the center of this object. I could either erase away what I have with a soft airbrush like eraser or I could paint gray on top of it. And which one you choose to do kind of depends on what you want as an end result. If this thing that we were painting was like a ghost or a flame or something, you would probably want to erase away because you're supposed to see through those things. You're supposed to be able to see the background. Um, if it is a solid figure and it just happens to be getting the same kind of gray color as the background here, then I would want to paint on top of it. So I could do either one, but depending on which one I pick, I'm going to do something different. Uh, for erasing, I'm not going to lock anything. I'm just going to switch to my eraser. Let's go for a airbrush eraser. And I'm going to make it pretty big. So you can see that there's a very gradual kind of fade here. We can't see any really size shaping on this. And so for an airbrush, you usually want to work fairly large compared to your object. And I would also recommend either you're going to sweep past the object in strokes like this, gradually getting closer, or you're just going to do one dip in and come back out again, depending on the shape. Uh, for instance, with this one, if I was using an eraser, I'd want to set it to about this large and just sweep straight past it once. Uh, same thing with the sides here. I might want to dip in once and go back or for the center of this round thing. But for these very large ones like this, I'd want it larger and I'd want to sweep past it, gradually erasing away, sweep past it this direction, sweep past it this direction. Okay. So for this one, got a nice large tool. I'm going to start pressing lightly and get closer and closer. Okay. And fade away and come back and press a little bit more and fade away and come back and press a little bit more until I get about the effect that I'm looking for. If that didn't go well, then I can undo back to full opacity. Or if I'm really worried that this isn't going to go well, I could always duplicate my layer. Okay. You can do Duplicate layer. I think it's Control J. Let's try that. Control J. Yep, there we go. Turn off the original. Do your work. And if you did like a whole bunch of different brush strokes and it's hard to delete and you go, oh no, I went far too far. Now, just throw that layer away. Turn back on your original and copy it again and try again if you want to. We do have undo in these programs, but usually there's a limit. Uh, mine is artificially lowered. I have like a 50 undo limit because I never ever use it and it just takes up memory. Um, and so I would rather just make a second copy of a layer to do any kind of experimental thing on. Okay. So with this erasure, if I go a few times through, then I can get pretty close and I can say job well done. Merge this down. So to merge, you can right click and do merge down or the hotkey is control E and it will destroy that other layer and now it's down to my main layer. Create another temporary layer and I could paint again. Okay. Any questions about that? All straightforward? Okay, let's do it the other way then. Now I've got my shape back, full opacity white, but instead of erasing, I want to paint gray on it. Okay. The first thing I want to do is protect this shape so that any painting that I do is not going to go outside of it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to grab my, hmm, let's get an airbrush, so a standard airbrush. And I'm going to sample this gray, this background gray. Oh, I was on my eraser. I'm going to sample this background gray so that I can paint over top my figure. And I'm just going to go ahead and start painting over it. And it's like, there we go. It looks fine. Here's the thing though. 
I actually painted a lot more than it looks like because if I move this, you can kind of see that gray bleeding out over the edge into this other gray. Or if I move it over this white shape, now you can see it really clearly. There's a bunch of hazy mist over the top of that because I did nothing. I just painted right over it with what appeared to be a background color. So if you've got a complicated background like a sky with clouds and trees, you're not going to be able to find one color that matches that. And if you were painting over a gradient, you're definitely not going to be able to match that. So instead, we should just guarantee that all our paint goes on the object and doesn't go flying off the object like that. So I'm going to undo and just make sure that, yep, there we go. I'm back to just this opaque shape. And I'm going to lock the pixels. So now if I hit this little lock button with this layer selected, you're going to have to keep track of what layer you're on while you're working. Um, if I try to paint something, it cannot leave the space that pixels already were on this layer. So before I did anything, I had painted this opaque shape, put some pixels down at a certain transparency. Now, if I try to paint somewhere where there are no pixels already, nothing happens. If I paint where there are pixels, I get pigment. And if I had some semi-transparent pixels, we would be able to see them as well. Okay, so now I've just made the entire thing magenta. Okay, so let me give you an example really quick. If I unlock this once more, switch to my eraser tool. Okay, and I'm just going to take a small chunk out of this like that. Relock. And now try to paint. See those semi-transparent pixels also count. Okay, I can make them semi-transparent magenta, but I can't make them more opaque once I lock those pixels. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Okay, so now I've locked the pixels on that layer. I'm going to just paint some gray with my airbrush right over the top. And as soon as I've got the look that I want, and actually this time, if I go too far, I've got the benefit of sampling the white side of this and painting back in some white pigment instead. Um, I can say, okay, there it is, job well done, merge it to the main layer and move on. So now if I move this, we should be able to see if I move it over this section, we don't see any bleeding gray shadow, or over this shape, we see a nice sharp edge with that gray color, okay? So those are two potential techniques so far. And no questions, you guys are completely confident. At the, moment, yeah. At the moment. You see what just happened there when I merged down to main? Remember how I was messing around with brushes earlier? This bounding box tells me that there's something over here that I drew and never erased fully, but it's really hard to see because I erased so much of it. If you ever get that sort of thing, you can just drag a marquee selection around that area and hit delete. And then hopefully, if you try the bounding box one more time, there we go. Whatever it was, I got it. Okay. Um, so I don't know what was over there, but something. Okay. So those are two methods of doing this. There are more, though. Um, actually, there's a bunch more, but I'm only going to show you one other way to do it because it's necessary for the, um, the compound shapes like this one. Maybe necessary is too strong a word. It's a good idea to do it for the compound shapes like this one. And also when we get into the color page, it's a really good idea for ones like this one, the square shaped one, um, the oval shaped one I think he actually demonstrates on, the sphere, this wedge, anything that has more than one color transition on it, it's a really good idea to use this second method, okay? Before I do that, do you guys want to see any one of these in particular demonstrated that you're not quite sure what you would do? And I'm talking specifically about the black and white ones. Yeah, if I could see the, um, the bottom middle, that would be cool. This one right here? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So taking a look at that, I have to decide, am I going to, oh, you know what, I didn't fill first and then chisel out. Let's use that for this. I would need to decide, am I going to make this shape and then lock it and fill in the next pigment? Or am I going to just do some pigment and then chisel it down? I didn't actually do that other method. So really quick before I do that one, 
Let me try uh, like this one over here, or this one would be a good demonstration. Let's just do the number two. So I could, before I make this shape, just initially start with an airbrush, grab the darkest color, which I think is this one here, and then just make a big blurry shape. Am I on the wrong brush again? Nope, there we go. I don't know why my brushes are messing up. Just make a big blurry shape that's dark up here and lighter down here. Now this will mean that it's semi-transparent. In fact, I'm going to go a little bit darker. This will mean that it's semi-transparent, but assuming that was the idea, then we could start with this. Okay. Then I could switch to hard transparent eraser and I could trim the whole shape down into the final form. So this is a second way that you can broadly approach um, painting new details. This one I'd say is useful if you've got maybe a large gradient over a complex shape or a lot of shadows that you want to put the shadows in all at once and then carefully trim out where they belong on the actual figure. Um, sometimes this could be helpful for a pattern or something like that. So you can see I'm trimming away like that. I still have the benefit of locking the transparency in painting or going back to my eraser and choosing a airbrush eraser now and lightening up this side of it. Now you can probably see some of the downside of using this method already. That looks fairly close, right? But what's all this out here? What's all that? Leftover. Leftover crap from when I used my airbrush, right? And look down here, it's very hard to see, but let me highlight it. Oh, I need a better paintbrush for that. Let's do a pencil. Look down here. Do you guys see the stuff that's left over down there? Because it's, it, it's in there. Yeah, but it's hard to see. It's easy to miss. So we could fix this all up by getting like a hard eraser, a hard transparent eraser, and erasing out very carefully. But there's always the chance that we leave a little bit of gunk behind if we do that. Uh, a more reliable method would be to use a lasso or marquee tool selection and stick pretty close to your object and you could encircle the outside like that or if it's the only thing on the layer and you know that actually select your object itself then invert your selection or inverse your selection so shift control I just about all programs are capable of doing that that means that now my selection is actually this area. As you can see, the edge has a little marquee. And this is not selected. So if I hit delete, everything except this has just been cleared. Okay. Then I can deselect and I can come back to my object. Okay. So that second method of doing things, of filling in the contents essentially first and then chiseling down into the shape, is useful. But I would say, you have to come across a situation where you're going to need that. I would vastly prefer to make the shape and then the color fill second. Okay. All right. Let's do the demonstration that he requested. Then I only just realized that when I started looking at this and thinking, oh, well, I never actually covered that first method. Okay. So I'm going to sample, I don't know, some middle gray tone from this and get a marker brush. I'm going to continue trying to use the method before where I'm going to make this overall wedge shape first and I'm going to make the whole thing. I'm not going to pay any attention to this division between the two colors. I've got a new layer that's blank and my main layer has everything else merged to it. Okay, So I'm just going to try to make this curving shape it's straight over here, curving shape straight over here and you can see like how messy this is because I only have to get it close and then start either filling in more pigment or erasing away with my eraser. So what kind of eraser? Uh, yeah, I got a hard eraser, perfect. So we'll get a nice solid line up there. Looks like I'm a bit too steep, something like that. And we could go back and forth quite a long time if it was a difficult shape. So it looks like pretty close. Let's try to get a little bit better. I'll fill that in slightly more, a little bit higher up. There we go. A little bit more here. And then I'm going to shape one more time. 
like that. And kind of like this. How's that? Is that closer? Nobody? Anybody? I think that's good enough. Yeah, yeah. Looks a little bit short. A little bit short? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's use another tool. Yeah, because this distance, right? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So that will sometimes blur that shape just a little bit. But usually if it's a small adjustment, it won't be enough to really hurt anything. Um, it also needs to be a little bit higher. I can see that this one. So you can see I'm being a little bit picky about this for no reason, because we don't really need to be picky about this. But when you're drawing and painting real things, you're probably going to need to be picky sometimes. And so one of the reasons I like this method so much of filling in a sort of silhouette first and then worrying about the contents is because you can check your work as you go like this makes it, in my opinion, very forgiving. Okay, sharpen up that line. We'll say this is good. You know, it's still, whoa, keep switching between the two tools. It's still a little bit off, but we'll say it's good. All right, so I'm going to lock the pixels of that uh, shape. And now I don't really have this whole effect, even on this side, complete yet. I've got one flat gray color. Can you guys see that there's something happening on the top here in terms of tone and then there's something else happening on the bottom in terms of tone Can you guys see that yes yeah okay so what's happening can we describe it it's very kind of dark in the middle of the bottom part yeah. so this part and i just made a new layer so i could do this this part very very dark Right? I just sampled that color and I would try to pick like the darkest point of it if I could. And all of that's happening all the way across here, except for over here where it's approaching the same color as the background. Right? So that area right there is going to need something either transparent or like paint. It's coming back to a medium kind of tone gray over here. But right here where it transitions, we've got like this very, very light color compared to the top, which is darker. So we've got like this compound effect. You can see I'm like putting all these swatches of color down. Sometimes what I like to do, um, let's grab, let's just grab some other random color like this. If you can't see on the background, you might need to put a background down like that. Um, so I'm going to grab all these little color swatches and kind of save them down here for myself to say, this is the like the edge transition gray. This is the one that it ends up way down here. It goes over to this gray over in the far left hand side. Here's the one that I'm seeing at the top. Right? Just so that I can color sample from here instead of the original image and I could mix them up and down uh, because sometimes you don't have something so nice to sample from and you kind of want to save yourself a little quick palette. There are actual tools for this. Um, there's swatches, but I prefer to do something more visual to keep it kind of traditional instead. Okay. So what I think I want to do then is I'm going to switch to a uh, airbrush. So let's go for a standard airbrush. I'm going to shrink it a bit. And I'm going to take this light color here, and I'm going to initially kind of just fill it in. Oops, I already messed up, right? I'm on a layer that contains nothing but that little palette right now. And down here, I've locked the pixels, but I didn't actually do something on that layer. So I'm going to use this airbrush to kind of paint in. It looks like this is the same color as that. So instead, I'm going to pick this top one. There we go. And I'm creating a little gradient transition across the part that we can see. In fact, you know what? I'm going to fill the whole thing so I can do it the way I originally intended and grab this lighter one. So I just want to see. That's pretty subtle, isn't it? I'm going to grab this much lighter color. There we go. Because I wanted to get this cloudy kind of transition across the top there. Because without it, I think it's going to be weird to have this dark stroke. Okay. I could keep going this way. I could make this dark shape across the bottom with a sharper tool, obviously. But if I do that now, look what happens. This tool was soft, which is good for this transition, but bad for the shaping. So I might have to switch between lots of tools really rapidly. This calls for another temporary layer. Okay. But it would be really nice if it restricted itself to this original shape. If I make another temporary layer, here we go. And then I make this kind of dark shape 
transition will make it kind of blurry like that switch back to my eraser I can trim down the outside to match but I might get it a little bit wrong right and I can trim down this edge to match but there might be a little bit of gunk left over like this so what would be great is if this would just do anything I tell it to only where there's pixels underneath it um, I know that was a really stupid sentence I just said there but we've got a, a specific tool for this so I'm gonna make a new layer this one is the one that has my shape on it this one has nothing I'm gonna right click and choose create clipping mask so this is a clipping mask means that it is sort of subordinate to the bottom most layer and it treats it sort of like transparency lock so on this layer I'm going to paint something obnoxiously bright so that we can tell the difference. Well, I thought I was. There it goes. So I painted a big green stripe. But watch this. I'm going to use the movement tool. And that pigment exists outside of this sort of window. Okay. The only thing we can see is where there's already pixels down here on this other layer. Okay but I can paint wherever I want. So I can make sort of this scanning kind of effect with it, which is nice and everything. But I can also paint details on the interior of any image and not worry about going outside the edges. What's even greater is once I merge this layer down with the original, all of that material that was hidden is gone. And so I don't have to worry about accidentally making a much larger shape or something. It's just trimmed off because it wouldn't be able to exist. Does that make enough sense, that explanation? Hopefully. Yes. Okay. So now I'm gonna paint in that dark shape. Okay, same way I did before. Kind of like this. And it's still messy and indistinct. I'm making it darker right here. But when I use the eraser now, we're basically done because I don't have to worry about the outside edge at all. Right? That's just taken care of. In fact, if I can see little problems here, now I'll make a much bigger eraser. I can kind of strike through that a little bit to lighten up that transition a little bit. Okay, So you guys see how I was able to use that to combine these two effects together? I'm still not done, but that's two of the three bits. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, So I'm going to merge that. And now the very last thing is just the fact that this is hazy over here. I could either use an airbrush and sample this gray color, or I could unlock the transparency lock and use an airbrush eraser. Okay, so I'm going to unlock, I'm going to use the airbrush eraser. Okay, because it's just one little area, I could always undo if I get it wrong. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we'll say. There we go, job well done. And we merge it down. Now this layer up here that I was using to make a palette has nothing else on it, I can just delete it. Okay. That makes sense for you guys? Yes. Yeah. Got a good idea how you're gonna approach all these? Um, can we take a look at um, one more time the, the normal brush that you're using to create the shape sure the yeah I probably could be using my ink brush which is the simplest possible one it's just either pigment or no pigment so you could do that any one of these we could just scribble out a shape and use an eraser or draw the edges really carefully or something like that but I'm using a marker or what I call a marker because it has a little bit of transparency and um, is still pretty sharp so I'll show you what a marker qualifies as as soon as I demonstrate it. So here's pressing lightly and then heavier, heavier, and heaviest. And basically I use this as a more forgiving kind of shaping tool because you get a little bit of imperfection here and there, which I find to be pleasing. Let's do a hard transparent eraser. So rather than getting like digital perfection, which is something that I don't I don't like very much. I want it to look a little bit more traditional and messy and a little handmade. 
Usually that's something that's harder to get with um, digital tools. It's easy if you're using pencil and pen and stuff like that, but it's really tough to get. Oh, I need to switch back to my marker. There we go. So I got eraser, marker. So it's harder to get um, that kind of handmade feel with digital tools. In the brush palette, what that looks like. Um, so it's still 100% hard round brush tip. I have shapes dynamics, but they're limited to 20% at the bottom end, so you can't get down to a point. And the transfer uh, appears I have no limit at all on the transfer. Um, I do have a small airbrush effect on it. In Photoshop, what that means is if you are continuing to push down and you go back over the same area again, it will put more pigment down. Without that, you've got one maximum um, opacity. So to demonstrate that, if I press lightly over here and move away, and then I keep pressing lightly and I come back again, and I keep pressing lightly and I come back again, this is getting darker and darker and darker every time I come back. Whereas without that, it would just be the same uniform gray, however hard I press. I like that effect, so I have that turned on. Awesome, thanks. No problem. All right, anybody else questions before I take a look at the color sheet? Uh, just for clarification, you're going to show us how to do this in Krita as well, right? Correct. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and I'm trying to keep it brief. I'll show you how to lock the transparency of a layer. I'll show you how to make a temporary layer and merge it down. And I'll show you how to make a clipping mask. That should be enough for Krita because they have a big brush selection already. You can just pick their existing brushes. Would the ball one be similar to the um, to the other to the one next to it? The ball similar to this one just above? No, no, the other one. The um, this one. Yeah. Uh, it's similar to both of them. But yeah, I mean, you can see I can actually see a lot of mess in this one, but. It's really just a potato shape with a sort of dark crescent, or if you like, a dark shape with a light blob in one corner. Either way of thinking about it would kind of do the trick. And you can take seriously the fact that we can see little brushes outside and little textures inside, or you could just ignore that and just say it was a quickly drawn kind of potato. All right. So like in some cases, these are some much, much cleaner looking, and some of them are a bit dirtier looking, like this one's a bit dirtier looking. Uh, if you want to try to recreate that, just use smaller brushes with build-up characteristics or uh, little bits of opacity. If you don't want to recreate that and just want to make them clean, that's fine with me. You just, you're mostly concerned about how the shading is. And really yeah. Do you have the proper gradient? Is it even close to the right shape? That's what I care about. And especially giving an opportunity to practice these methods. Okay. All right, so here's the color sheet. Uh, the color sheet has more challenging uh, effects, right? The upper left one is simple again, just sort of a blue and a cyan. Um, this squarish one has three tones, really, a kind of magenta, a light yellow, and a, or light orange, and a dark orange. But some of these might pose a bit of a puzzling challenge to you. Do you guys want me to demonstrate one of these? Or do you think that I gave enough techniques already for that? One of them would be nice, yeah. Uh, do you have one in mind? What looks like it would be the a problem? Top left one where it's got a mix of color. That one? Really? I think that's the, the easiest one because it's just the same thing I just did. It's a shape and then you use an airbrush, either cyan or blue. Right? How about the bottom cube? Bottom cube? Okay. Um, sure. That one is similar to this one up here, only you do it twice, right? Pick a basic tone and then you're going to fill in this and then fill in this or one of the other two. Although there is kind of a stripe here. So let's do that bottom cube. Probably a little bit more complicated. Um, by the way, when you're first laying in this uh, shape, 
if you want to just kind of make the shape, trim it down, you can start with any color you want. It doesn't actually matter because once you lock pixels, you can recolor it, you know, with whatever color is appropriate. So just for the fun of it, I'm going to block this in with this really bright, obnoxious magenta. Okay. Just because we have that ability to do that. So I'm going to get the basic sides laid in and then fill in the middle and then trim it down into a nice shape. You might see that I do that sequence a lot of like just kind of blandly filling it in and then being a little bit more careful with the eraser and I just find it to be a fast way to work. If you like to do it a different way feel free as long as you get good results. And I'm trimming down the corners just a little bit there. All right. Well, right enough. Sure. So I'll go ahead and lock transparency. And now sample. Let's sample this one. I think maybe these two sides are the same. Let's find out. They're slightly different. They're really, really similar. But there's definitely a lighter kind of color, I feel, right here. Maybe on these other edges and then definitely on this one face. So let's pick the, which one was darker? Yeah, let's pick that one. I'm going to fill in the whole thing. That can't be right. Oh, I think I, when you select your eraser and you have locked uh, transparency, you will by default use the secondary color in your color picker. So the eraser kind of has two modes of working. If it can't affect transparency, it uses that other color. If it can affect transparency, then it does that and it cuts out the shape. So you could use that to your advantage to quick shift between two colors if you wanted, but I don't think I would recommend it. Uh, all right, so here I've got this color laid in and I'm gonna sample this top one. Let's try to just basically lay that in. I've got a pr fairly soft brush. No, I don't, I have a hard brush. I'm gonna pick a fairly soft brush. Let's go for, yeah, let's just stick with the airbrush the same way I've been doing, but I'm going to make it small. Okay, so I'm going to lay it in there and there and just kind of fill up this space. So that will count as like one whole side of this, I think. For this, I'm going to need a new layer. And for this little stripe, I probably won't. Let's sample that stripe. Is that good enough? Boom. Just put it in like that. Yeah. Probably. Okay, let's make a new layer. I'm gonna use a clipping mask because I think it's a convenient way to do this. Sample. Okay, I'm gonna keep this airbrush fairly small because although this is a soft edge, it's not out of control like a complete gradient. So I'm just gonna draw in, there we go, and then fill in the rest of this completely solid. And I think that's it. But since I'm on this layer, I could switch to my eraser and sharpen that up a little bit if I want to come back to my airbrush and soften it just a tad more just to be picky about it for really no reason at all other than demonstration okay good enough yeah merge it down bingo got it okay any others you guys definitely want to see think that they pose more of a challenge or puzzle. I think you guys can handle these. All right, let's move on. Last bit, and it was a part of the last video, is just an opportunity to use all of these methods in one big constructive assignment. And so what it is is to fill in all of these different facets, facets of this geodesic dome uh, in with their local colors. And if they don't have one, just assume that it's like the background color is what they wanted. Uh, but you could choose, like if you think it looks good, to pick one of these other colors and like do kind of a mixture of two of them together. So this is now, wow, that went invisible real fast. So he's probably right, but you could find like, here we go, a very, very slightly different tone for that panel if it makes you happy. Um, so I've got a layer already, uh, serving the purpose of my main layer here. But the idea would be that every single panel you should do on a temporary layer, make it nice, merge it down. Was there a question? Thought I heard somebody. No? Nope. Okay. 
Um, the benefit of working like this is going to be twofold. One, you can get every panel perfect and then combine it. Two, if you paint underneath what you've already done, you will get some edges uh, done for free for you. So I'm going to sample right here. I've got a really blurry brush. I'm going to pick my marker again. I like the marker quite a bit. And I'm going to go ahead and just make nice brush strokes along the edges. There's a little bit of overlap, but I'll get that with my eraser. Okay, kind of like that. Switch to my eraser, trim off whoop, a little bit too far there. It's okay if it's not 100% perfect, but there we go. Notice I'm always zooming in, getting close enough to the work to be able to see it clearly. You don't want to do all of this at like a full zoom level. It would be murder on your back and possibly your eyes, depending on the lighting of your environment. Okay, and fill all that in. And we'll just say, great, one panel done. I can merge this down. Now, if I want to make my next panel, I can paint on top. And that means that if I go a little bit too far, I start cutting into this. But instead, why don't I paint underneath like that? Just move that new layer underneath instead. So now I can't get this edge wrong. There's just no way, right? And so I'll fill in the rest of the panel. Like this being yeah, semi careful. A lot of production method is about speed rather than super accuracy. And so that's why I'm frequently doing things the way I am. Go. Trim it down a little bit to get it nice. Little imperfections don't really bother me too much, just as long as I've got it basically within the bounds. Then I'll merge these two. Okay. Do a new one underneath. Grab this color. Now I've got two edges that I can't go wrong. Okay. Now I look at that and I say, wouldn't it be nice if this was a little bit darker on this side? I can do that. Okay. And if I choose a suitably subtle color difference, I could even just use an airbrush eventually to kind of fade that very slightly across this panel. Okay. Now it's filled in full opacity so we can kind of see the streaks. There we go. But you can see how quickly eventually you can get working just by properly using your layers like this. Okay. Trim a little bit. So now I can grab this color, for instance, go to an airbrush, go standard, lock that layer's transparency, blend that. There we go. Okay, so I got a little gradient there. We can see back in my original layer, I have little bits of, you know, kind of messy looking painting. Let's get marker. What I could do is an entire separate step once I fill in all these panels is make a temporary layer above all of this, resample those local colors, come in and true up the edges so that they look a little bit nicer, like that. And I could select all of these neighboring colors as much as I want, then merge that. So here's the difference, very small difference. Merge that back down with my main layer and keep working, okay? So you can do the shadow underneath that way. You can color the actual ground you can see that there's a color swatch here for the ground and what that means to me is that I should use a big unfocused airbrush underneath everything to kind of give this appearance of it being lit kind of like that but underneath everything else that I paint including this shadow okay so keep that in mind that there is a color swatch for the actual ground down here any questions about that? No. no. Are you sure? You guys are so quiet, so confident. Wait, that, that color on the bottom right, that white color, is mm. for what exactly? It's for the floor. Oh, okay. So here's a shadow, cast shadow color, and then here's the lit floor color. So the background right now is this neutral gray. Whether you decide there's a horizon line or not is kind of up to you, but there's definitely a color that needs to be addressed down there. Can you use the lasso tool to clean it up? Sure. 
Yep. I just typically don't because I'd rather just erase and draw. But yeah, if uh, I'll unlock the transparency here and choose a marker. Let's get in close somewhere. Let's say, uh, so I did this edge, went over a little bit like that. So instead of using an eraser, I could come in kind of like that. Remember the last edge will always be perfectly straight. Hit delete. And now I've got a razor sharp edge on that final line. Usually that's not a high priority for me. I prefer it to be a little bit more hand shaped than that. And so what I might even do is come up and hand draw that edge so that it's a little bit wobbly and delete it out. Yeah. Or if there's some particular problem, you know, just take a few swipes at it and maybe paint back and forth even. Any of those tools is fine. Okay, eraser, whichever. Make sense? Hopefully. Yes. Okay. So just as a reminder, this is the one that I originally completed when I found out about um, the course. I went so far as to put some reflection gradients on the faces. I did some edge highlights based on where I thought the light was coming from, some bounced light from the floor up to the panels, little bits of contact shadows, softened out the cast shadow a little bit more to make it more realistic. Basically trying to paint it to the utmost that I was able. Give this a shot. See if you can figure out how to make it look more realistic or give it more detail than is asked for. If you're really struggling, just fill in the panels and you're good, okay? If you can make it better, make it better. Uh, also, this is a great opportunity to try to make little uh, tiny details that you might want on future assignments, like if you're gonna do robots or um, characters or something like that. So for instance, if I make a new temporary layer up here, let's see, what will I do? I'll make a, uh, I'll make a edge right here. I'm gonna turn my brush down. Okay, so there's a little edge through here but I could tr try to give it like little extra bits of detail. Like how about like a scratch or two or like some damage or make it look wobbly or something. Some of this would rely on your ability to do uh, observational drawing or observational painting. But if you know what you're doing, I mean really know what you're doing, then you can get some really cool looking effects in here. So I'm gonna try and make that look like a scratch by darkening one side a little bit, kind of like this maybe a little too much there, and lightening the opposite side just a little bit like that. And then this kind of awkward edge, if I could figure out which direction the light was coming, let's grab that color, then I could give it the, the appearance of like flecking paint if I put on like a dark edge on one side or maybe even a neutral edge on the opposite side. And you could go quite a ways, like let's zoom out a little bit. So little bits of detail on there, probably not perfect, but better than just a plain geodesic dome. Probably want to tone this gray down a little bit and figure out exactly what I'm doing in terms of detail. You know, chisel away these corners or something. Cool? So don't go nuts unless you have a strong idea of what you're doing already and the basic painting procedure is okay for you. But if you're gonna breeze through this anyway and you already know that, then take this the next step and try to make it feel more real than it already does. Okay? Cool. Let's take a look at Krita real quick. I'm going to go ahead and open that up. And there we go. So I'm just going to do, actually, can I just drag my brush control exercise in here? There we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna use this one as the demonstration file. Again, I'm gonna want a new file on top of my background. Okay. I'm gonna zoom in. Let's do, let's do this orange one right here. Okay, the brush selection in Krita is right up here and they've got a lot of them separated by different categories. I've already got a preset kind of category down here as well as ones that are on my hotbar up here. But they've got so many brushes that I would be shocked if you couldn't already find exactly what you want. In particular, in the digital section, 
are all of these ones that we were just discussing. So this one has no features at all. Oops, gotta go over here. Um, this one is a size and transfer brush. Let's see, I think this marker here is similar to what I prefer to use most of the time. There we go. What else do we have? Um, this one looks like your kind of standard digital blending brush. A little bit too dark for my taste, but it's fine. Here's a slightly, there we go, a slightly less dense one. Okay. And what else in there? Looking for an airbrush. I think maybe just not in this category, like this one maybe. That one kind of does it. Okay, so a bunch of those brushes are going to be at least somewhat appropriate for this. Find ones that you like, okay? This brush panel down here is already my collection that I use the most often, and it has an airbrush, I think, from a different category. Quick question, are you using your mouse to that? Because I can hear clicking. No, that's just the sound of me touching the plastic. Oh, gotcha. No, I got a, a stylus. It's just very hard plastic and my mic picks up everything. Okay. So here I've got, whoa, it's huge. I've got an airbrush, right? So that's good. And I think besides that, maybe just this one. I mean, I think just those two are the only ones I would really need besides an eraser. I do have two erasers in here because sometimes you want a nice sharp eraser. Sometimes you want a gradual soft eraser. So I would say having two of those is usually preferable. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just delete that layer and make it over again. Okay. And let's go ahead and try to do this one. So I'm going to pick this semi-transparent brush just because it's a little bit nicer to deal with. Um, let's see if I can remember how to sample. There we go. Control to sample. I'm going to zoom in so I can draw nice and big. Shrink my brush probably a bit. And then just get this basic shape. Okay, so initially I'm just going to fill in the center, pressing pretty hard so that I don't have any like little oopsie mistakes, little bits that aren't filled in. Then I've got erasers set to my first two hotkeys on my top bar, but I'm going to pick this one, the hard one, I think. I'd actually prefer one a little bit softer than that, and I think, you know what, I think the eraser that I've got on my hot bar set to one is actually yeah it is actually a little bit softer than that how about two two is just the fully soft one so I don't want that okay so we'll go back all right so I'm just gonna pick this one so you guys can see which tools I'm using trim this into shape looks like I kind of messed up there in that corner I'll fix that in a moment okay Okay, and let me switch to my brush one more time. I'm gonna shrink it. Usually the hot keys for um, expanding and shrinking the brush are just the bracket keys, they're right next to the letter P. But you can always do that right up here. There's a slider in Krita for that. And in Photoshop, it's right inside of the brush itself. So there's our shape. I'd say good enough for a start. Lock those pixels. I could do the second step right on this layer without even the need for a temporary one, or I could make a temporary one already. So I'm going to start off by making this top tone, right? Using, mm, let's go for the softest digital brush here. I'm gonna sample the lightest portion of that color, fill it in nice and dark up here, and then let it fade out when it approaches this edge. Because that's all that looks like it's necessary. Notice how I'm giving no cares at all for when it crosses down into this purple area, because I'm about to cover over that anyway. So no care for whether or not I'm going into that space because it's not going to be seen. Okay, there we go. It actually does look like there's a little orange right there, so why not? We'll just fill that in. There, little orange just on the corner there. Okay, I'm going to make a temporary layer. So new layer right up on top. Um, I can right now try to make a clipping mask or because I look at this shape and it's just a rectangle I could just paint it so for this one in particular I think I would just paint it 
like this and then get my hard eraser to trim it down because for some reason it looks like um, I don't know like a jelly filled donut or something where I can kind of see the orange edge around the whole thing I'm not sure if that was intentional or not but if I want to preserve that then I could do it like this okay let's assume that I actually do want to um, turn a clipping mask on though because it'll be a better example so I'm going to delete that on your original layer the one that is going to serve as the clipping mask we right click and I think we go to add transparency mask I always forget which oh I think it's group quick clipping group that's the one okay group quick clipping group so this whole group is the entire effect your original layer is the template that it's going to use for the clipping mask the next one up has this little letter A struck through and that's what controls the, cl the clipping mask. So then if I use this brush, there we go. We can see it can't go outside of the shape, but if I turn that A off, we'll see the rest of it. So you could temporarily do that if you wanted to. Okay. So then I'm going to trim it down just like we did before. And same as in Photoshop, once you merge it, the stuff that is off the edge just won't ever be seen again. Wow, that was really bad. Oh, it's because I've got this weird shape of eraser. It keeps changing size as I push, push down. Anyway, there we go. So once you merge all, and to merge all, you could just grab this whole group, and we could say merge group, same control E shortcut. It all becomes one layer and anything off the edge is gone. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Yes. I believe that's all that's necessary to demonstrate to show that we can do everything in Krita that we just did in Photoshop. Am I missing something? I think that's it. Just to show that we can do a clipping mask and transparency log. Just for the, the previous uh, like last step, of um, merging? To, well, no, not merging, but like to blend it in a little bit more. Would you just use an eraser? Oh, if I wanted to trim down the the magenta square. Well, because the the pinkish reddish color is kind of faded on the left. I'm not sure it is. Um, that's a good observation, but when I look at it, I think it's just an optical illusion. But if it were, then yeah, we would use a, a airbrush eraser. Or we could sample a color and lock those uh, pixels. So let me go back to where I had the group. So here's the group, and it's basically trimmed into shape. Whoop, I'm on the wrong layer. There we go. Basically trimmed into shape. I can lock these transparent or these pixels also, and then sample like this reddish color, and then paint. And it will only not only you know restrict itself to this one. It's also going to restrict itself to this one as well now. So I could do a little fade there now that I've activated that. Let's turn it off for just a second so we can see. You can kind of see it over here. But uh, yeah, you could, you could lock pixels on any of those additional layers if you wanted to. Someone has a question. Mm -hmm. Can you show how to use Canvas? Uh, canvas sizes. Canvas sizes? Like setting the initial size of the project? Like file new? Is that what we're talking about? It's, uh, like where you have the it's like canvas sizes where you're stacking stacking them on top of each other. Um, I don't know what you're referring to. This is the layer palette, and I can make a new one and place it wherever I want just by dragging it. Is that what we're talking about? Oh, so the the square the squares that are behind the shapes like um, 
so like the the three stacks of of the canvases behind the shapes oh oh right so you want uh, all of the assignments in one file but larger yes yes in photoshop i would assume yeah in photoshop okay uh, if I turn them all off, I'm just going to turn them all off to where I can just see the bottom most one. All of these were approximately the same size. This one's a little bit smaller, but that won't matter. If I want to give enough space that I can fit them all vertically, then I'm going to go to image canvas size. And then I could do the math and find out what the number is for height, but there's an easier way. Just change this to percent and do 300%. If I hit enter right now, though, it's going to be 300% from the middle up and down. And I would prefer to have this first one either at the top or the bottom. And that's what this anchor is for. If I want the next one to be beneath it, then I'll anchor this at the top. That way it's going to add the extra 200% below this original one. Or I could do it from the bottom or corner, whatever we want. So clicking that anchor. 300% means it's going to be three times as tall, like this. Okay, So now I can take this second worksheet and just drag it down, line it up like that. And I can take this third worksheet, drag it down, line it up. Okay, um, I would probably prefer to merge the three of them at this point so I have less layers to worry about. So like that, I'll go Control E, Control E. Oh, it won't let me do that one. Merge layers. Okay, there we go. Was there a reason? I actually don't know the reason. It was a smart object. Oh, okay. Well, I thought the other one was too, but oh well. Just to fix this up, this very last one down here, I'm going to get my paint bucket tool, put a blank layer underneath everything, sample this color and fill it, and then just merge one more time. So that just made sure that I filled in all of those transparent pixels so I've got a completely opaque setup for my file. So now everything I can do can be on top of these layers somewhere out here. Ooh, I don't know why I had all that weird stuff at the top. Um, but now you've got to be careful because you might ruin your previous work if you're too careless. I would say if you finish an entire worksheet, leave that on a layer by itself and hit the big lock, this one. That means can't move it, can't delete it, can't select it, can't paint on it, can't anything. Do that and then do the rest of your work on other layers. That way your previous work is completely safe. Okay. In Krita, I'm sure we can do that, but I haven't actually resized very much. Uh, let's see. Image resize canvas. Yep, all the same options. So this is pixel. We set it to percent, 300%. Anchor from the top, OK, zoom out, place the other worksheets down there, merge, etc. Cool. Yeah. Great. All right, you guys, any other questions at all about how to do these techniques, how to use them properly in both programs, how to complete your homework, etc.? because that will be the end of the video. All right, very good.